Louisiana, especially using a public health lens, which is the lens that I approach it with, it, you, you can't just take into account individual behaviors or individual knowledge. It takes into account societal level factors and community level factors. Um, and here we list some of them. And if you're interested in any of these, these are all in the report and I have a link to the website at the end. Um, I'm just gonna talk on a few today. But at the end, I am gonna go over some of our recommendations. So instead of describing all of these factors that contribute to STIs in Louisiana, I'm gonna speak about them in actionable terms and the recommendations. Um, so our goal of this report is, it's a purpose-driven goal, is to provide evidence-based um, data to policymakers, people in academia, healthcare providers, social workers, and anyone else who is um, charged with improving the health, the sexual health, especially of women and girls in Louisiana. So we just compiled all this data ourselves, and we also did some in-house analyses. Um, and we're going to work with these entities to in improve sexual health for everyone in Louisiana. All right, so what exactly is the problem? Uh-oh. <laughs> it's a big problem. Um, what is the problem? <laughs> what is the problem? Uh, um, I don't know what I Help. Is that me, or? I think you turned it off. I think I did, too, but I can't turn it back on. Oh, there we go. OK. So as a state, we have some of the worst rates of STIs in the country. We rank 49th for chlamydia, 45th for gonorrhea, 46th for syphilis. Um, we also have some of the highest rates of HIV and AIDS in the country and perinatal HIV transmission um, and congenital syphilis, which means a baby is born with syphilis because their mom, when they were pregnant, had untreated syphilis. Uh, okay, well, these rates of STIs vary widely by parish, and they also vary widely by race and ethnicity, and what's not shown here, they also vary widely by um, gender orientation and sexual orientation in, in this state and elsewhere, but especially in the state. And um, some of these differences by parish, by race, by sexual orientation, sexual identity, may reflect um, a difference to access and uptake of healthcare, uh, both for STI prevention and treatment. We also know that STI rates are five times higher among black women than white women in Louisiana. Um, and these rates also vary by parish poverty level and um, by income inequality within the parish level. And in, within our own analyses, we found that STI rates are higher among black women than white women at every societal condition that we were able to measure, like poverty, unemployment, income inequality. Um, and so that leads us to conclude that there's these unmeasured factors that like racism and access to, to quality health care that may explain some of these inequities in STIs. So in public health, we don't take, we don't look at the individual, what the individual is doing. We're looking at what in the community, what in this, in this state is giving us such high rates of STIs. Why are there such big racial disparities? This is not a behavioral thing. This is not completely like a, a knowledge difference, which I'll talk on a bit with like sex education in the state, but it has more to do with these factors that people cannot control. They can't help where they're born. They can't help, you know, how much their parents make and things like that. So we look at this in a broad societal um, perspective and that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, <laughs> very it's fast so now. Um, okay, so in the report, we talk about all of these factors that are related to sexual health and STIs in Louisiana. All of these things contribute to our, um, our high rates and the disparities in these rates. Some of them are risk factors for STIs, like sex education, access to reproductive health care, LGBTQ plus health, um, and others are sexual health indicators, like what are our abortion laws? That's kind of like a, um, an indirect show of what our reproductive health and how much we, we value it in this state. Um, so I'm just going to discuss two. One is sex education in this state. 
So, how many of you had sex ed or have or having sex ed in high school? Raise your hand. Did anyone have no sex ed in high school or when they were in high school? Yes. So, um, it's really unfortunate. This is because we are a state that permits abstinence plus education. Abstinence plus doesn't, it means that we can have comprehensive sex education, but any sex education must be within the context of abstinence messaging. Um, so if, when I was a sex ed teacher, if someone asked a question about sex, you have to first answer it, you're supposed to first answer it like, well, you shouldn't be having sex, but if someone does, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's an abstinence plus sex education. Um, however, schools are not legally required to teach sex ed. Um, and in fact, although most parishes have adopted some type of sex ed policy for the, for the schools in that district, 20 of our parishes have no sex ed policy, which means that they are not allowed to teach sex education. So that's about one third of all parishes in this state do not teach or, and are not allowed to teach any sex education. Um, and, and another thing with our sex ed policies is that most of these federal funds that we receive to do have sex education are aimed at school-aged um, students. Um, but we are also, but because of the state laws, we are not allowed to ask students about their sexual behaviors or their sexual beliefs, which is important to know one, how well are we teaching them sex ed, and two, to be able to see where we need to improve. You have to have some kind of baseline measure of what students know and what they're doing in order to improve. And we know that we need to improve because the STI rates, especially among adolescents, are very high. And compared to, we know that our STI rates among adolescents in Louisiana are one of the highest in the country. All right. The other indicator that I'm going to talk about is that influences STI rates and these disparities is access to sexual and reproductive health clinics. Um, reproductive and sexual health care. We also have what's called publicly supported clinics. Every parish has at least one of these. And these are clinics that receive federal funds specifically for reproductive um, and sexual health care. Um, and then accessing that one, some parishes only have one, accessing that's a whole other story. Um, but we do know that these, these type of services are really useful in this state. Um, these alone, the last data that's available is from 2015, we, these alone help, they serve 67,000 um, clients for any kind of reproductive health. Um, and in doing, so, in doing so, they help divert pregnancies, um, about which half would have ended in birth, a third would have ended in abortion, and the remainder would have been um, a miscarriage. They also help prevent um, hundreds of cases and thousands of cases of STIs. They also provide really important um, HPV vaccinations and pap smears, which help prevent cervical cancer. So these services are really important, but access to either an OBGYN or some kind of um, like safety net reproductive health clinic, these publicly funded clinics, very strongly in Louisiana depends geographically on where one lives. So there's also some societal conditions that impact STIs in the state. Poverty, unemployment rates, income inequality, and education. And these are, these are conditions in Louisiana where women are born, grow, live, work, and age. And these policies related to these things, um, these are shaped by policies that, that um, distribute money, power, and resources at local and state levels. And so health inequity is when there's a difference in health that has nothing to do with um, like the individual. It's, it's, a, it's a difference in these health outcomes. They distribute these resources unfairly that benefit some groups more than others. And that gives us the rise to the health disparities, which is the difference in rates. All right. So, um, it's well established that high levels of poverty, unemployment, income inequalities, and low levels of educational attainment and median household income are some of the major societal factors that determine individual and population health in Louisiana, 
This is across all sorts of health outcomes, not just sexual health, but also sexual health. Um, so in some analyses that we did in-house at the Mary Amelia Center, these economic conditions are associated with STIs across the parishes. Um, and so, so when these levels are at their highest or their lowest, depending on if it's a negative or positive one, um, we found that STI rates were higher among black women at every level of societal condition, which means that even black women who are living in the most advantageous um, conditions, such as parishes that have lower poverty level or lower unemployment level, still had considerably higher rates of STIs than black women who are living in the most disadvantaged areas, um, you know, areas with higher poverty and higher unemployment. So this leads us to know that there's some kind of unmeasured factor in structural racism being one of them. It's a hard thing to actually measure with data, um, but there are some ways of doing it which aren't really important to talk about. But we found that structural racism was not statistically related to STIs among white females, which suggested, but it was among black females, suggesting that structural racism at the parish level may be particularly detrimental to um, black women's health. And um, um, so structural racism in general is, is the system in which public policies institutional practices, cultural norms, um, and representations work in various and often mutually reinforcing ways to produce and then also perpetuate racial inequities and opportunities and resources. So structural racism, institutional racism, these are leading to some of these differences in rates of STIs that we see. Sorry. Um, all right, and then so community conditions is a little different than societal conditions. So societal uh, way to think about it is like more statewide. Community is in this context, I'm talking about like at the neighborhood level. And so in this report, we also examined how community conditions, neighborhood level conditions impact STIs. Data is not available at the neighborhood level. So we just looked at um, data that is available from other resources. Um, but, sorry, but to go back, we do know that the neighborhoods that women live shape their daily experiences, their opportunities, the behaviors, and these have profound implications for their health and that for the health of their children. And so this is talking about relationships between members of a household, with, between members of community, and broader community um, things that influence women's health in important ways. So neighborhood level factors that are associated with sexual behaviors and therefore risk of STIs and also um, related to STIs themselves are poverty has been associated, neighborhood level poverty is associated with HIV risk, racial segregation within the neighborhood. Uh, greater social disorder, which is, um, includes things like violent crime, poverty, vacant housing, housing neighborhoods that have higher levels of these have higher risk and higher rates of STIs. Um, neighborhoods that have more social disadvantage have higher rates. Um, and during pregnancy, the risk of, of getting an STI is higher for women if they live in neighborhoods that have higher degrees of racial segregation and income inequality. So this brings us to the final section of the report where we provide recommendations to inspire action and changes to improve STIs and sexual health for all residents of Louisiana. And these recommendations are grouped by levels of the social ecological model, these concentric circles you see here. And this allows us to highlight the range of factors that operate on multiple levels that put women at risk for STIs um, and suboptimal sexual health. So these overlapping rings and the figures show how one level influences the next. And so in order to prevent STIs and reduce the disparities in STIs, um, it's necessary to act across the multiple levels because they all interact and impact each other. And this is the only way that we're gonna have long-term and sustainable health equity. Um, 
So most of the recommendations we have are at the societal level because this would have the largest impact and the largest reach. Um, and so specifically, we recommend increasing health insurance coverage. We still, even though we expanded Medicaid in 2016, which was great and did a lot for women's health um, access, we still have one in 10 women of reproductive age who do not have any health insurance. We also recommend increasing access to sexual and reproductive health services like abortion, preventative services, STI prevention and treatment, and contraception. Collectively, these all influence sexual health and STI risk. We recommend increasing funding for um, sexual and reproductive health services. Um, we also recommend advancing reproductive justice. The tenets of reproductive justice is the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and then to parent the children that we do have in safe and sustainable communities. And so everyone who's providing reproductive health care should uphold and honor these um, tenets of reproductive justice, both directly and indirectly, um, by providing reproductive health services to all people who need them. And then lastly, at the societal level, if we reduce poverty, increase economic and educational opportunities and improve housing, we will see improved health outcomes and reduced health disparities. Because we found that when just looking at those factors alone, those can increase or decrease your risk for STIs. So that has nothing to do with what you know about sex at, at, at a population level. Um, but just doing those alone would improve sexual health outcomes for people in the state. Um, at the community level, we recommend um, implementing comprehensive sex ed. This means having evidence-based, making it required for every parish, and also having it standardized so that we can then be able to measure and have a baseline and be able to track progress over time. Um, recommendations at the interpersonal level, we need to address institutional racism. This impacts sexual health and reproductive health, um, addressing stigma, especially those faced by persons living with HIV, with STIs, or people in the LGBTQ plus community. People in these communities um, perceive and are actually discriminated against, and so this impacts how, how and when they access healthcare services. We also recommend expanding and diversifying the healthcare workforce and expanding the responsibility for addressing STIs. One example of this is to include um, parents and in, in giving them information on how to educate their children, um, but also including primary care providers and pediatric providers to talk to parents and how to talk to their children about STIs besides talking to their adolescent patients themselves. And then lastly, we only have one recommendation at the individual level to increase education about sexual health um, for all students in secondary schools. We just have one recommendation here because we believe that equipping all individuals with the knowledge is necessary to make informed decisions about their bodies, but this goes hand in hand with addressing the social and political power structures that constrain the ability to act on that knowledge. So that's why we only have one here. It's important, but it can't be done without these broader things happening as well. Um, lastly, I just want to make a mention about the, oops, sorry, just, <laughs> just want to make a, um, a note about the pandemic. So the data that was used in this report was the most recent data available, and this was all before the pandemic, um, the, the data was. Um, but we do know that the, from current pandemic times that women, particularly women of color, are especially vulnerable to the far-reaching economic health and livelihood impacts of the pandemic. So it is more imperative and more urgent than ever that policies and programs to improve the sexual health among people in Louisiana reflect the principles of reproductive justice and promote healthcare access by enabling all women to achieve their reproductive goals. Sorry beginning somehow. Um, I wanted to, oh, that was my extra slide. Um, okay, so this is a link to the full report if y'all are interested. Um, and there's my contact info. Y'all can email me with anything. 
questions, comments, um, and thank you for listening. If anyone has a, oh, I think we'll do Q&A at the end. But anyway, thank you all.
Um, it is put in place by a healthcare provider, and it can be painful to have it put in. Um, IUDs can actually be taken out um, by the individual themselves, but typically it's taken out by a healthcare provider. Um, the other type is the implant, which is a rod that goes in your arm. Has anybody heard of that? Yes. Oh, lots more people. What have you all heard about the implant? Anybody else? Well, everybody is different. So yeah, some people in fact that same live in a gestural hormone. So some people have no periods, some people have light periods and irregular periods. If you're used to hearing about um, being able to skip your periods or have one every three months, you're probably thinking about a combined contraceptive. So either pills, NuvaRing, patch, those have estrogen and levonorgestrel, um, which is progestin, and the estrogen is what helps you kind of control your bleeding. So with these um, long-term, the work, they don't have those estrogen components. Thank you. And do I click like mm -hmm. out this way? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so as was very clearly described um, by uh, Melissa, the social determinants of health are those conditions in our environments where people, where we are born, where we live, learn, work, play, worship, that affect this wide range of health outcomes, health decisions, um, and including, oh, sorry, including LARC, use, access to LARC use, and then the quality of healthcare around LARC use. Boop. Very sensitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so am I, that's okay. I'm also very sensitive. <laughs> okay. All right, let's do this slide, because <laughs> this is a good one. So um, one thing, of course, that we know is that things like your biology, your genetics, even your individual behavior, those are often not the most important things when it comes to determining the health outcomes that you have. So we looked, as Kat said, at a lot of the research around these social factors that impact LARC use for adolescents. And we were particularly interested in this question of LARC, these long-acting reversible contraceptives um, the research done on adolescent use because, as you all may have experienced, adolescents, are, their sexual lives are often really stigmatized. Adolescent and pregnancy, pregnancy in young people and adolescents is often really a shame-based conversation, a fear-based conversation. And as Polly's going to talk about, then some providers or some, not, not Melissa, but some public <laughs> health folks come in and say, okay, well, we just need to give teenagers Give all of them LARCs, give all of them IUDs and implants, and that's going to solve poverty, and that's going to solve all of these educational attainment issues, and that's way too simplistic of a conversation, right, first of all. And second of all, it doesn't take into account these social factors that impact pregnancy, that impact LARC use. So in addition to your own kind of biology, behavior, genetics, what are some things that have impacted your decision to use birth control or not use birth control? Maybe the relationship you have with your healthcare provider? Yeah. The side effects of that birth control? Hearing people's personal experiences? Yeah, like stories that family members, friends, people on social media have said? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like your parents or your moms feel on birth control? Yeah, your parents or your moms feel on birth control. Not having sex. Not having sex. 
yeah, your relationship with sexuality, with your own sexuality, with sex. Penal vaginal sex. Yeah, not having penal vaginal sex, other types of sex. Um, one other thing that I think a lot about in New Orleans is transportation. You might live in a city with amazing reproductive health care providers, with, let's say, even a program for free contraception. But if you can't get to that provider or to that resource, then if you don't, let's say, you live in a city like ours with somewhat limited public transportation, you don't have a car, you can't afford a car, public transit is down because of hurricanes or other events, then you don't have the same ability to make decisions about your contraception and your health as someone else living in a place with better public transit. Any other like social factors that have impacted your decision to use or not use birth control? Yeah. Uh, religion. Religion, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a Catholic school uh, graduate, so that definitely impacted my life. I saw one hand here and then here. Yeah, the knowledge on it. Being too fertile. Being, what, what does too, so I heard being too fertile. What does too fertile mean? I have 10 kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, have ten, I have eight, but I'm very fertile. Yeah. So I take it so I will get pregnant. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So your fertility goals, it sounds like, combined with the children that you already have. Yeah, yeah. Family structure. What type of family structure is, um, yeah, your your goal, if I could say. Yeah. Or um, let's see, what else? We also are going to talk about um, in the reproductive justice framework a history, maybe not even your own, but in your family or community with racism in healthcare. Um, perhaps you or someone in your family or someone in your community has experienced shame, stigma, judgment at the doctor's office or maybe even specifically when accessing birth control. So I'm going to turn it over to Polly to talk about reproductive justice. Can you slide the computer over? All right, so we're going to talk about reproductive justice. And before I switch over the slide, I want to see you all paying attention. Melissa did mention the tenets of reproductive justice. Can someone recite those out to me? No pressure, but your life depends on it. I'm just kidding. Verbatim or just? Just whatever you heard, whatever you remember. You can only say, like, you can say all of them if you feel comfortable remembering all of them. You can say one, whichever one you think. Just someone say something. No? The different levels. Societal. Societal, yeah. So it's a, uh, yeah, societal is the different levels. But there was um, four different things that reproductive justice focused on. And I know it's. I talked really fast. She says she talked really fast, which is okay. So we'll just go to the next slide and talk about it a little bit more. Oh, well, it really is finicky. It really is. Okay. So. What Melissa had said is reproductive justice is basically um, the right for women to maintain personal body autonomy and also the right to have children if they want to, not have children if they don't want to, and also parent their children in a safe and comfortable environment for their kids. Um, Before today, have you ever heard of reproductive justice? Yeah. It's become more and more, a little bit more in the mainstream population. Um, Have you ever heard of reproductive rights though? Yeah. So what do y'all know about reproductive rights? It's a little bit different. Um, like a lot of white male politicians are trying to strip us of them. Yeah, that is very true. Um, anything else? That was a good answer. Yeah. Absolutely. She mentioned that a lot of white male politicians are trying to strip women of the reproductive rights which is a good answer. Any other um, thoughts about reproductive rights? And what about uh, the, the big thing now with uh, the right for women to choose to have an abortion? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Absolutely. She mentioned the right for women to have an abortion. That is um, pretty much the gist of reproductive rights. That was a very good answer. So a lot of times, the way that we've been talking about reproductive health care in the country has been focused on looking at reproductive rights, which is the right for women to access you know, reproductive health care, like abortion, like contraception, um, different things that we mentioned. The problem is that, is that it really only looks at um, reproductive health care in a very simple lens. So it really only looks at an access issue. And it really only takes in, you know, like why maybe a fluent woman in mind when it's thinking of access. Um, when it comes to minority women, there's a lot of other factors, like Melissa mentioned, like we all mentioned, that contribute to your ability to get access to contraceptions or abortions and things like that. And um, in around 1994, um, a group of black women and women of Africa diaspora came together and they were like, you know, reproductive rights is good and all, but for us, it's a little bit different just because you say, yes, you have rights to get contraceptions or um, yes, you have a right to have a child. That doesn't mean that the environment is friendly for us to have those opportunities. Um, access isn't the only issue. There's a lot of things like racism that affects our ability to have the same thing that other women have. And we need something to, you know, really think about that whenever um, we're talking about access to care. And so they came together and came up with this um, term reproductive justice with the tenets that we mentioned, um, thinking about um, the different structural or societal factors that contribute to um, barriers to access to care. So, this is a really great video, it's like one minute, um, that kind of does a good job of explaining what reproductive justice means better than I did. So, what? I guess this is the playback. Can we play back there? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> if you think about the, the combining of reproductive health and rights with social justice, you, you develop a construct called reproductive justice. Reproductive justice started as, as an analytical, as a framework, as a movement, right? But in 1994, several black women really actually coined the term. And it really started off thinking about sex associated with reproduction, right? Produces a pregnancy. And so what are the rights of that person? It is a human rights-based theory of practices that posits four very important things. People have the right to create family and to create kin in the ways that they see fit. What are the options available to you if you choose to pregnant and to birth, right? Birthing shouldn't really be totally in the hands of OBGYNs, and I say that as an OBGYN, right? So how do you think about the birth workforce and the birth support team? They have a right to prevent and or pregnancy if that's something that they need to do for themselves and their families. What to do if you want to end the pregnancy and how do you do that with dignity and safety and respect? They have a right to parent with dignity without manipulation, coercion, or violence from any individual or from the state. People who currently have children, what are the um, supports and services and accommodations that the community and the government are accountable to our community to ensure that people can continue to, to parent their children the way they want to in the family composition that they choose in order to disassociate sex from reproduction, which I think is really important because then that affords us opportunities to have discussions around consent, healthy sexuality, pleasure. And RJ opens all of that up um, so that we really think about options and power and autonomy and not control, constraint, and coercion. Yeah, so that's basically reproductive justice. Um, Right. Um, yeah, those two women, they are very into reproductive justice. They are um, very knowledgeable about, about it. Um, I think something that um, I think Dr. Scott also mentioned was like birthing, like right to, you know, have the type of birth that you want, whether it's like a vaginal delivery or like the right to have different people help you deliver other than an OBGYN. Um, you can have a midwife, you can have like a support person, um, just the overwrite for women to feel comfortable with the reproductive health care and have access to things. And so basically like this says above here, reproductive justice um, just believes that everyone should have the right to control their body and access to the resources they need. And so how does that um, play into LARC care? So um, one of the things that we think about with like LARCs, especially with adolescents, is how we promote LARCs to you guys. So a lot of the research, like Kat mentioned, when we look about LARC usage in adolescents, it really is um, sh 
talked about as the solution to all these structural inequities. So people will say that, oh, if we just give every single adolescent person a lark, then we will never see poverty again. Like we will never see any like educational issues. Like we will solve world hunger. It really goes to that level. So people really put the pressure on adolescents and lark usage um, as a way to like solve the world's issues, which is really oversimplified and honestly a lot of pressure for adolescents to have. And so there are two ways we can look about LARC promotion and um, adolescents. And so we can look at it through the reproductive rights lens and we can also look at it through a reproductive justice lens. And so if we're looking at it through a reproductive rights lens, some people really say that um, certain populations like adolescents or young adults um, they typically are being denied LARCs because people are concerned that LARCs don't actually cover, S, um, cover um, STIs, STDs. So LARCs really focus on helping you maintain um, not getting pregnant when you don't want to or, or um, whenever you're ready to, but they really don't cover STDs. So you still need like a condom or some other form of protection to make sure you don't get that. People are worried that with adolescents, if we're just throwing LARCs at them, then we're not really going to um, be able to address that one area of like SCI, SCDs. Um, some people also um, assume that by giving adolescents LARCs, um, that adolescents just are like these sex crazy kind of people and that like once they have this, they'll just do whatever they want without any um, thinking about risk or any of the dangers, which is also unfair to you guys too because um, Y'all are a lot smarter than sometimes people give credit to adolescents, and so that really doesn't factor in everything. Um, when we look at it through a reproductive justice lens, though, we really think about if birth control and LARCs um, are really useful for you guys. So we understand through a reproductive justice lens that no, birth control or LARCs is not going to solve world hunger or like is not going to create world peace. Like it's not. That's not what it's for. The goal of this is to make sure that you guys are able to attain your own reproductive and sexual goals. And that's how we should be focusing our narratives about it and not really as a way to help us with all societal issues. I was get confused. I know. So yeah, like I said, um, basically the way that we have been talking about how we promote LARCs to young people is very much as a solution to world issues. But really, when we do that, we fail to recognize that the societal inequities um, is the reason for you know, things like teenage pregnancies or poverty or um, in income instability, and it's not a result of it. So you being pregnant or the risk of you being pregnant is not the reason for poverty. Poverty is the reason why you know, teenagers don't really have good access to sexual health care or sexual education. Um, and so a lot of times the provider pressure on women of color, especially to use LARCs, is really linked to racism um, while also soliciting policies for those um, with physical and intellectual disabilities and is shaped in um, disability and racial discrimination. And so with our project, we really wanted to analyze the way we were looking at um, LARC usage for you guys and just you know, provide recommendations for how we change that in the future. So what we see in what Polly was talking about in providing LARC um, to individuals to solve all the world's problems, right? That's a really individualistic look. And so we're ignoring all these other social determinants of health when we take that stance. So thinking about the results from our study that we found out that many research studies are not adequately measuring race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality. In fact, I think, um, like four. I think it was zero studies measured um, sexuality and sexual orientation. Um, so even asking whether or not somebody is having penile vaginal sex, there was one study that did measure um, sexual behavior, but not orientation. And so when there's a systematic um, lack of measurement, I just want to ask you all, I mean, what do you all think the implications of that are when the best minds and the best information that we have are completely ignoring these factors? What do you all think? It ties into practicing fake sex. Mm -hmm. 
How, can you tell me a little bit more about that? can take these protective efforts to protect yourself on an individual level against these things that are going on in the world. Anybody else? I wonder, um, any ideas about what might be, what might your healthcare providers, what might researchers in public health and policymakers be missing if we're not asking questions about race, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender? Open. Open. Yeah, I definitely think that you definitely need to be more open. Um, going back to what I said, adolescents are a lot more intelligent than we usually give you credit for. Y'all are a lot more reasonable than we give you credit for. And we know that, you know, when we provide you information about, even if it's like drug use, when we give you information about drug use and we give you information about sexual education, um, y'all have all the information you need to make the best decision for yourselves. <laughs> Gold star.
Yeah. I, I'm so glad you said that because I think something that I was thinking about was another way of phrasing Kat's question is how does it feel if you fill out a survey or you go to the doctor and your options for checking the boxes are white, black, other? Or the question is when you have sex with a man, what type of birth control do you use? <laughs> that, to be clear, like in our research, we found that people are looking at demographics, but they're using super limited categories that don't reflect the complexity of the lives of people who use long-acting reversible contraceptives. They don't reflect the lives of people who have sex or don't have sex. And so I feel like what you're saying also is just a brilliant way of capturing the fact that the way that we talk about the differences between groups or the patterns across groups or within groups is really important because then we can help design like actually meaningful sexual education. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say how it's like pretty counterproductive and it almost comes off as like performative mm -hmm. because like how can you do research on one group and then claim that you're trying to help like the majority right. when the majority is like full of minorities. Yeah. They're so smart. I know. I'm so proud of them. <laughs> um, if I may, I want to ask a question. I want to ask a question to my group, too, a way that they can have maybe better understand what you guys are trying to play. So, ladies, how would you feel? We as most of those here know that everything is political. There's a hidden agenda behind everything. So, how would you feel if you were not giving the knowledge about your body? How were you not given the knowledge of not the different options that you have? How would you feel if you're not giving the proper health care as a black woman who's going to have a baby? Because it has been proven that whites tend to have more attention, more care when they go into a hospital than a black female that goes to go have a baby and have a delivery. How would you feel if you get less treated as a black female going into a hospital, having a baby, learning knowledge. Um, a lot of time they do research and the research doesn't really benefit the black woman. The research does not benefit the minority, the woman. So how would you feel if you, people like Tulane, are not getting the opportunity to give this research information to you? Like you're being left out. Or LSU calling out to you. <laughs> Me personally, sorry. Me personally, I will feel frustrated and mad because I might be allowed to take care of myself. And, you know, if I, let's, let's just say, I'm going to give an example. Let's say um, my cousin is pregnant and um, she goes to the doctor and she doesn't even get the knowledge to help, help treat herself. After the pregnancy, and like as well, uh, help the baby as well. So that's endangering the baby and herself afterwards. So I mean, I will feel frustrated and mad because I feel left out of the knowledge that I can take care of myself. So that's that's how I feel. I just want to add something real quick. Um, kind of flip what uh, you young women were saying up here in the front, that what about if we don't even know there's differences, or like the care isn't being focused towards people with higher rates? I'm gonna flip that a little bit and say that, let's say in some cases it's true that we do know that there's higher rates and there's higher risk among people of color, or people are among sexual, different sexual orientations, like HIV is higher among men who have sex with men. So what if providers know this, and a lot of them do, and they treat you differently because of that. They treat you as a risk factor because based on your race, based on who you have sex with. And then if you're not treated well during that interaction with your provider, then you're not gonna go back to that provider. You're not gonna wanna get a LARP even if the provider tells you, here's all of your options, here's the pros and cons of each, 
which one would you like to use to protect yourself against pregnancy or whatever your reproductive goal is? And if you're not treated well during that interaction because they're treating you as a, a, a statistic and not what your actual lived experience is, then you're not going to go back there. So you're going to rely on birth control methods that don't require an interaction with the, your provider, such as condoms, which are one of the least effective methods at preventing pregnancy if that's the goal. They're really good at preventing STIs, um, but you have to be able to use them correctly and be educated on that. Um, so I just want to say that it, even providers who know that it's how do they use that information to give you the best treatment. Um, I feel like in some ways that could be kind of a good thing, like them using actual statistics to kind of change the experience that women of color may have. But I also feel like obviously you want it to be based on your lived experiences, obviously it's how you are and how your life is. But to get back to your question, I feel like it's not really a scenario as to like, okay, what if they were treating you differently or this is like a disproportionate type of thing because in reality that is how it is. You know, there are like statistics that prove that black women are most likely to die while giving birth and all this. So it's not really a scenario because it's true. So I feel like the bigger question would really be how do we change this? How do we make it better instead of trying to it's like it doesn't exist because it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want to clarify, I'm a researcher, my life is dependent on statistics, on all four statistics. I just meant to say, how do we use them and how do we not discriminate based on statistics? There's a way to use them to benefit people, and then also sometimes they're used to discriminate. Mm -hmm. just okay, I'm not going to say like the whole situation is done purposely, but I feel like when it comes to black women or like African Americans, it's done for me. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Sure. that 
the statistics don't serve us, nothing really does. But I think the problem in healthcare is the fact that our doctors, if we have white doctors or if we're just buying into the white institution of medicine in itself, it doesn't serve us because they don't know who we are. The reason that I, as a black woman, know about a lot of the challenges that I face as a black woman is because my mom had them, and so did her mother. And the tradition of the familial understanding of what we go through as opposed to learning in any kind of educational camp, besides the class that I'm in with, with my professor. Um, but, no, but seriously, like, the things purposefully don't serve us, they don't want us to know about ourselves or the challenges that we might go through because they don't want us to be successful or to thrive or to live. Um, so, like, it, it's just, it's multifaceted in that the statistics would serve us if we had doctors who also understood us. Um, and if we had, like, more researchers who were willing to collect the information and dispense it in a way that was accessible to the black people and black women who need them. I really like what you said. I you made me so happy. All of you made me so happy and so like hopeful for the future. Um, <laughs> I do want to touch on like agree with what you said about um, just the fact that the statistics don't really help us. Um, I feel like and y'all can add to this too because y'all are more on the research side. Um, I feel like now we're seeing that like there's a difference between what we call quantitative research and qualitative research. And for those of you who have never heard like those words in research before, quantitative is like getting the numbers. So like saying like 50% of patients have like this issue or like we have seven patients out of like 20 that have like this disease. Um, that's all fine and dandy, but sometimes we need to dig a little bit more and like get more information about these patients and like why they have these disorders. And so that's where qualitative research comes in. And with qualitative research, we do a better job of you know sitting down with people and saying, okay, explain to me your experience with like the healthcare system, or explain to me like um, your experience when you were trying to give birth or whenever you were trying to access contraceptions. And with that information, we do a better job of understanding you know the societal issues that contribute to you know um, people having different diseases and having problems accessing different forms of care. And so I really do like how you mentioned um, focusing more on the lived experiences of black women because we're starting to realize that um, the numbers aren't really as helpful as you know going to our patients and asking them what are what is the issue? Like what are we doing wrong? So um, and I think I also wanted to to share too how even some qualitative research can also be rooted in white supremacy mm -hmm. and colonialism. And one thing that came to mind for me, of, of, and, I, and I definitely agree that qualitative research can do that better job of finding meaning. Uh, but a lot of the uh, categories we use to understand race in this country come from the, does anybody, like what just hap what happens every 10 years? The census. The census. And the categories, they're changing, right? They, they change for this most recent census. But they're rooted in a, uh, I believe he was Swiss or Swedish philosopher who came over, does anybody know this history, this story? Yeah. Do you want to? No? <laughs> uh, well, you, you correct me when I get it wrong. But he, uh, you know, in the tradition of colonial qualitative research and racist qualitative research, came to the US looked around and said, oh, I see these different groups of people. And it was all based on sort of his racist observations looking at, oh, these people seem to look similar. These people seem to look and behave similarly. And that's where we get these uh, really familiar categories of white, black, Asian, etc. And so I just want to, um, I guess, yeah, talk about how even the very project of categorizing human beings is a colonial white supremacist project. Let's you know, rather shift to talk about our experiences, what they mean to us, and how we can build better bonds of solidarity in healthcare to end obstetric racism, racism in healthcare, rather than continue to just categorize the immiseration of people according to these labels. All right, so thank you all so very much for um, for a presentation this afternoon and uh, to the join me in thanking my family.